Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Bill Tulo, and welcome to the most updated keratoconus management guide, part two. And I want to introduce my co-lecturer tonight. Everyone knows Dr. Clark Chang, but I'm going to give him a proper introduction tonight anyway. Clark is an optometrist at Will's Eye in Philadelphia um, at the Cornea and Contact Lens Specialist, where he specializes in designing specialty contact lenses for optical rehabilitation in patients with various corneal conditions. He has an OD and a Master's of Science in Low Vision Rehabilitation. He completed his fellowship in cornea and contact lens at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute in Teaneck, New Jersey, where he concentrated in providing post-operative, pre-operative care for refractive surgery patients and participants in clinical trials on site. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the Scleral Lens Society. So Clark, welcome tonight. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Bill. And thank you for uh, you know everybody who makes us sound good here. <laughs> So I want to also recommend to everyone attending this lecture, if you're interested in Keratoconus, a fabulous resource for education that has no cost involved is the International Keratoconus Academy. Clark and I are on the board of that academy, and um, we all supply educational information for, for um, clinicians and patients with Keratoconus. You can visit it at www.keratoconusacademy.com. Um, again, great, great resource. So save that one in your favorites. So quickly to our disclosures, um, here's Clark's disclosures for tonight. And my disclosures for tonight also, again, I'm medical director of Oculus. Clark, why don't you take it away? I thought it would be great if we do a short recap because um, tonight we're gonna focus primarily on the treatment of keratoconus. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the diagnosis, which is essential in the early diagnosis. So take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who joined us last time, this is a short recap, I promise, uh, just because number one, at the end of our last uh, episode, we um, we had promised that we would do a short recap where we left off. Number two, there's some um, very you know, pleasantly surprised that there we have a lot of uh, uh, newcomers joining us here as well. So I'd like to give a, a little recap. I think would uh, really help us all get to the same, um, all get a, get to the same page before we continue on to the treatment. So remember, last time we were talking about the consensus paper from 2015 uh, that collected experts from four different supranational cornea society in terms of their opinion of how we should, for all eye care uh, providers, how we should diagnose and monitor keratoconus patients. And some of the statements that I thought was worth mentioning was that number one, the criteria that they thought uh, were mandatory to diagnose keratoconus, some of which that we have been doing so far, and some may be depending on technology barriers in our clinic, potentially will be getting there pretty soon. And so, and the, those criteria is the number one, uh, the, the fact that the uh, posterior elevation abnormality must be present, um, and that obviously we have uh, not, we will not be able to do without tomography uh, or a tomographer, and abnormal corneal thickness distribution, again, surrounding um, from the thinnest point, I should point out. So not from the geometric center of the cornea, but from the thinnest point of your cornea going outward, the changes in the relationship of your corneal thickness. That's what the distribution is referring to. Again, you can map that with a tomographer so far not uh, because the ability, because the, you need to image the posterior and the interior and then be able to subtract the difference to get that distribution. And the, and the fact that the thinning must be non-inflammatory um, in nature. And so therefore it brings us to the fact that diagnosing mild or uh, early mild or your subclinical sub keratoconus in order to differentiate between say subclinical versus a mild keratoconus, you must then have uh, be able to if be able to uh, document or you know to the degree to which the posterior corneal elevation is abnormal and that really currently the best uh, uh, technology that I have to rely on in my clinic at Will's Eye when I have see patients every day is the be is a, a, um, a tomography that is shine fluke and obviously what I have is a pentacam in my clinic and so when would you then 
you know, now that we 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 are uh, on the same plane uh, with regard to the playing field with regard to um, diagnosing keratoconus and what's required, and you may think, okay, well then, what do I do once I diagnose my keratoconus patients? Because after all, you know, you, what if you catch them now? You did such a great job combining all the risk factors and the uh, clinical indicators that we talked about last time, and so what happens after that? Is it, you know? because obviously now that we do have different treatments available compared to five, 10 years ago, or even, or going even way back, that um, you know, progression is now of the utmost importance in terms of being able to detect them when the disease is on the early um, you know, stage of, of movement. And so the, again, that um, the same group of experts gave their opinion with regard to you know, having to at least, would like to at least see two different changes in two of the following parameters, such as the uh, steepening, progressive steepening, meaning over time, of the anterior corneal surface, check that we do with topography really well, right? And steepening, again, same thing over time uh, on the posterior corneal surface, again, cannot do that without, just, I cannot do that with just topography, need tomography to do that. And that uh, corneal thickness distribution rate would change uh, over time as well. So, and depending on disease and instrument uh, or the system you use, must at least be able to understand that obviously most of these instruments will have slight difficulty in you know, reproducibility when imaging extremely irregular cornea and therefore the sort of noise in the system or the variability would be different. So those needs to be filtered out when you are monitoring your patients. But I personally think this next sentence to me is one of the most powerful statement, and I know Bill will be surprised. Um, I think most powerful statement from this uh, publication is the fact that it states that progression, although could be accompanied by a decrease in this spectacle corrected acuity, a change in visual acuity, um, meaning a re, you know a drop in their best corrective visual acuity, is not required for such documentation. And why I think that's so important is I feel like we for so long have used corneal transplant as a sort of refractive for its refractive property or therapeutic property, as uh, well as contact lenses and all that we see. And pardon the pun. All that we do. Um, you know, pay attention to in our keratoconus patients is their vision. If they're seeing well, we define their disease by their vision. It does not really quite matter if their disease is severe, looking at their K-max or looking at their, you know, anterior posterior elevation. We tend to think that as long as there's some way of getting them to back to 2025, 2020, and hopefully more, then therefore there is no progression, or at least there's no progression to have to do anything about. And I think we need to separate the visual component as well as the morphology and the disease component so that we could fully utilize the instrumentation and the treatment option that we have in clinic. So what are the, uh, the, what are the instrumentation that we could rely on uh, in this case? So remember last time we also talked a little bit about utilizing different software capacity within uh, Pentacam. And one of the more powerful tools, rather than just looking at your regular format layout, those of you who are um, familiar with uh, with what a shine flu topography basic output looks like with the four maps, um, will realize that obviously you're always comparing to a reference plane, right? So whatever, it's the same thing in topography when you're looking at curvature, you have a reference curvature and then you have the image of what the software interprets as the cornea that is being imaged. And the, when you overlay the two on top of each other, the difference, if you are above, then you're steep or you are, you know, um, and then if you're below that reference plane, which is the yellow, uh, the, the yellow semicircle that you see here, then you the map will show either flat um, or less elevated, whether you're looking at curvature map or uh, elevation map. So you see in the next slide that um, when that is the basically the theory that is being, or the principle that is being used to come up with an even more sensitive um, software output in addition to supplement that format output uh, display of just your axial map, your anterior elevation, posterior elevation, and your thickness map. There's the um, this 
Bellin and Ambrosio um, display or your BAD in that you see the two columns on the left hand side is your anterior posterior elevation BAD map and the the top two map are the the one that you see in your basic four map output the middle two map are your, your enhanced map which means that in order to enhance the uh, the ability of seeing subtle cone if we could somehow lower that yellow circle that we saw, the reference plane in the previous slide, then obviously that distance between the triangle apex denoting a cone um, and the reference plane, that distance gets further away from each other so that your difference map would then give you a warning such as the top map that you see here on the your uh, left upper um, hand, uh, corner. You'll see that red spot in the posterior elevation telling you that maybe you didn't see that in the original four map output, but now that you have the map enhanced, it, it, there is some level of abnormality. And then you if you follow that arrow, you have those two thickness distribution maps that, that shows you the relationship of the distribution changes in the corneal thickness from the thinnest point traveling outward. And where, if it falls below, at the very least, if it falls below those two dot, those three dotted line, that means that you are outside that, you're outside of the two standard deviation of population norm, telling you that some, something then is, needs to be investigated further and it's abnormal. Um, and you could see that arrow pointing to a more severe keratoconus patient where that red line is the, um, is, is, you know, falls definitely way below those two, um, those three black dotted lines telling you that something needs to be investigated. And um, so that is your, um, that is the result of removing the, um, the central three millimeter area because the, um, the central three millimeter to four millimeter area surrounding the thinnest point, which usually indicates where the apex is. So if you remove some of those steeper values, then your reference plane will drop. But what if you want to then use that uh, um, sort of use the reverse to monitor progression, right? Remember, once diagnosed the patient, what's really important is to uh, decide if the patient is progressing or not. Well, we I think most of us would agree that the first area that's more likely to detect progression is probably around the apex. So this time we're going to flip over and look at that central three uh, to four millimeter area that was excluded for the enhanced map and now use this to look at um, progression in a way that um, would be more sensitive than before. And so you have the ABCD that actually does exactly that. So uh, using that centralized area that describe as much as possible your cone morphology on your cornea, you have your a, um, ARC, which is your anterior curvature, then you have your a PRC, which is your B, your posterior curvature, then your uh, thinnest location of your cornea, which is your C, and then your spectacle vision, not contact lens vision, your spectacle vision uh, in your D. So using that ABCD um, Oculus and Dr. Bellin um, with uh, collaborators looked at um, both normal corneal population and as well at which you see in the green gate or those green flags uh, and statistically given it a cutoff value to say if there's certain change from visit to visit um, then you know you will either come to the 95 percent the solid flag um, that gives you much more statistical meaning to say something absolutely has changed even if you are very mild or normal cornea and then the red flags are comes are derived from the keratoconus population that shows you that, um, you know, because again, their variability is different. So you couldn't look at normal cornea the same as keratoconus cornea. That's why you have to separate them and study them differently. And again, so those uh, values I find really extremely useful in monitoring my patients to see if uh, there's any change in their ABCD category. And if the value is significantly different, uh, such as reaching statistically 95% confidence interval, then um, it, then a lot of times most or most experts would agree that just one category of change is probably enough to say that some that this keratoconus patient cornea has um, progressed versus potentially you want more factors, at least two, uh, reaching 80 um, percent of statistical differences to say, or confidence interval, I should say, um, to be able to say, yes, something likely has changed. So those, I really like those subtleties in the, uh, in the um, software's ability to track patients for me, especially over different dates. 
So hopefully, and again, if any questions, I know I'm going through these really fast. If there are any newcomers that have questions, uh, please feel free to enter into the chat box and we could come back to visit, uh, revisit the, uh, this slide later on or, some, uh, or something similar. So if we advance to the following um, slide, you will see that I would have show you an example of why this is really important, right? Um, because you, if we're just following patients with um, topography, and this is a, a case courtesy from Dr. Michael Bellin himself, um, why is ABCD very important and why is tomography important? Um, because we need to look at the thickness distribution, because we need to look at the posterior elevation. If we just look at anterior elevation, you could see that we often you know, encounter this these missed opportunities when we can intervene and help patients, where I'm showing you that a very early keratoconus patients at age 15, um, there's virtually no change in the anterior metrics. Even if you use Kmax, that is at least more sensitive than a lot of the, you know, keratoconus indices that you may get from a, a regular topography, you could see in this patient over 13 months, the posterior elevation has changed. Right. And it's visit after visit documented within that sort of, you know, a little over a year. And think about the times that we let patients go for every, you know, every, maybe they're 2020 minus or 2025 plus, And we're not quite sure what has changed. And then we tell patient, we'll come back in a year or two. Well, a lot can change within a year or two, especially if you're looking at these more sensitive uh, metrics such as the ABCD. So again, very important, I think, for us to pay attention to if we really want to take care of our patient the best possible. And so, um, Bill, I'll, uh, I know that there are new treatments that you want to introduce us, so uh, take it away. Thanks, Clark. Um, I think this is really a, a fantastic opportunity of collaboration, and I know there's a lot of opportunities between optometry and ophthalmology to collaborate, but I think keratoconus is really an ideal one. Um, if we look at the challenges involved in taking care of our keratoconus patients, we just discussed the number one challenge is early detection. Prior to cross-linking, early detection really wasn't crucial and really didn't alter much in the course of the patient's treatment. But now with cross-linking, really, we know that cross-linking works the best before vision is lost. So it really behooves us, and we're going to say this over and over, but to really look for keratoconus before keratoconus finds you, you need to find it in the patient. And we'll talk about some of the ways we can do that. But optometry is really key positioned because we see the majority of keratoconus patients before they're detected um, in our primary clinic. So we need to really be on the lookout for this condition. And the second challenge, again, is to once we identify the condition, is to stop it from taking vision away. So getting them cross-linked and freezing that cornea in place so that they don't lo lose further vision um, or don't lose any vision at all and prevent them from ever uh, having to go uh, to a corneal transplant. Um, and then the third challenge is back again in the optometrist lap, and that's the vision re rehabilitation. It's important to remember Keratoconus is not a tool to restore vision. It's a tool to save and stop progression of the disease. These patients still need um, fairly intense visual care for the rest of their lives, and that's where optometry plays a key role. So um, even if these patients start out in ophthalmology practices, which is not the majority, they're going to end up uh, likely in an optometry practice to take care of their either their contact lens or their spectacle needs. So how do we do this? Again, in the United States, um, most practices aren't fortunate enough to have a tomographer, whether it's a, a Schleim fluke tomographer or even an anterior OCT tomographer. The majority of practices don't have that. So what do we do? How do, how do we screen our patients? Outside the US, most vision clinics are centralized, meaning that um, the majority of the patients in the population will go to just a few clinics, and these clinics being centralized have a lot of this technology in place, and they've incorporated into the routine annual visits screening tools like tomography and topography. But in the U.S., that's a challenge. So what do we do as, cl as clinicians if we don't have all these tools? Well, here are seven key steps that you should keep in mind whenever you see your patients, especially your young patients, that may be emerging into keratoconus and maybe you don't have a tomographer to look for. So what do you look for? Number one, we know that keratoconus is an asymmetric disease. So again, always look for asymmetry. And number one asymmetry is refractive changes. When you see one eye change and then you see two years in a row, one eye change and the other eye didn't, 
be highly suspicious. If you see a frequent contact lens refit, especially again, one eye being more problematic than the other or, or larger changes, especially astigmatism, be suspicious, especially corneal astigmatism, be suspicious. If a K reading exceeds 47, especially in one eye only, be very suspicious and consider uh, sending these patients out, especially young patients, for additional testing. Subjective visual complaints. Maybe you might refract someone, they get their glasses done, and they come back and they still complain, I, well, I can read it, but it's not clear. And again, maybe we don't have aberrometry and we can't tell if there's emerging coma or other reasons for the quality of vision to be lost. But when patients start complaining about subjective vision and they didn't complain about it in the past, consider that as a warning sign. Number five, best corrected vision. Again, patients should have symmetric best corrected vision with normal corneas. Uh, we found in studies that we did amongst large populations of patients that as little as three letters of asymmetry between the right and left eye with no other explanation is significant and may be an emerging case of keratoconus and warrants further inspection again with a tomographer. Strong family history, whenever we see a patient whose brother or sister or father or mother has been diagnosed with keratoconus, they should be had, they should have surveillance, especially if they're young, surveillance with tomography. And again, medical history. If they have atopic disease, they have any collagen diseases or chronic eye rubbing, all of these conditions should make you think about the possibility, even if they are best corrected to 2020, if you see any asymmetries, you should start to suspect that maybe this patient requires more testing. And again, become friendly with a practitioner in your, in your town that has these kinds of tests. And the easiest way typically is a refractive surgery center. I worked with TLC laser eye centers for 20 years, and we used to have patients come over for um, Pentacam studies all the time that weren't refractive surgery candidates, but just to get screened to make sure that these patients are not emerging keratoconus. So again, even if you don't have the technology, these seven things should go through your mind anytime you're seeing a patient in routine practice. And it only takes a few seconds to consider these things during a typical routine annual exam. So the mantra, again, is to look for that keratoconus, diagnose it early. Again, don't wait for the patients to lose vision because, again, cross-linking, as wonderful as it is and it's amazing, is not predictable as far as restoring vision. Some patients do get improved vision, many do, but not in a, not in a, a predictable fashion. So we need to get them treated as soon and as early as possible, as soon as we diagnose that progression as Clark talked about. Again, the, and the goal again is to maintain that quality of vision, quality of life related to the quality of vision. Let's talk about the uh, Avidro now Glaucos uh, FDA study in 2017 where they got approval. It's been five years already. We now have approval in the U.S. for cross-linking. It felt like forever until we got it, but we do have a, approval. And let's talk a little bit. I think understanding the study helps us a little bit understand about the patients that may benefit from cross-linking. Number one, the inclusion criteria was very broad. We had patients as young as 14 and as old as 65. Um, they had to have a diagnosis of keratoconus or post-LASIK or refractive surgery ectasia. They had to have an axial topography consistent with keratoconus, meaning either 47 or steeper, or an IS ratio, which is an inferior, superior asymmetry of at least one and a half diopters. Um, they had to have best corrected vision worse than 2020, and they had to have a corneal thickness. And no, it's not 400 microns, it's 300 microns. And we'll talk about why they included patients in the study as low as 300 microns. And again, they had to be progressive. We'll talk about the actual indication, but the progression is important. They had to satisfy one of these four conditions, either an increase of one diopter in steep K over the last two years, an increase in one diopter of manifest astigmatism, a myopic shift of half a diopter on the subjective refraction or a steepening of the opticals, the back, the back optical zone or the base curve of the rigid contact lens by 0.1 millimeters or about a half a diopter. So any one of these criteria would, would include them in the study as progressive patient. Again, but it's, in, it's, it's, it's important to know that this is the population that was studied. It doesn't mean that you can't 
recommend a patient that's outside this criteria, but it's also it's important when you look at the data to know this is the population that was studied. And here's the results um, of the K-max changes. And the study, the phase three study was a, was, was a study with, with two controls. One was a sham group who didn't get any treatment um, and the other was the actual treatment group. And you see in blue, the treatment group, as time went on, their K-max got flatter. And the sham group continued to worsen over time, as you would expect in the pink uh, graph here. And Bill, just so, a very quick, um, uh, just a really quick message on the on the uh, trials that you, um, the FDA uh, pre-FDA trials that you had just talked about. A lot of I get a lot of questions too, especially when I lecture in uh, this area. That um, do we really have to wait for two years in order to demonstrate progression? And it's important to understand that that uh, exactly what you said, which is within 24 months means if you collected enough data within three months, that's progression. You do not need to wait for 24 months before you're able to do something for your patient. And that's and that's really important. I think especially when you're dealing with the young patients. And the ones that are progressing fast, there is absolutely no reason to wait that 24 month period to start consideration of treatment. Um, and as we're going to show some data in a few moments, it's those young patients and those rapid progressives that really need to be treated immediately and, and, and we can't waste any time. This slide shows you the approved cross-linking procedure and platform. There are three components to it. Again, the indication is for progressive keratoconus or progressive corneal atasia following refractive surgery. And the three, the three parts of the platform include the treatment device, which is the KXL um, ultraviolet light delivery unit, and the two solutions, which is the Fotrexa viscous, which is the main solution, and the Fotrexa, which is your hypertonic solution. We'll talk about how we use the different riboflavins on different patients. So let's talk about actual cross-linking procedure. It's actually a fairly simple procedure. And again, we're talking about epithelium off approved cross-linking. The patient's given a speculum to keep their eye open and some topical anesthesia. And then the, then the surgeon will remove the epithelium, typically either with a brush or a spatula, just like you would with PRK. And then the cornea is soaked with the Fotrexa viscous, which is a normal Fotrexa, not the hypotonic one, and one drop every two minutes for approximately 30 minutes, um, or until when if we see flare. Flare, we wanna see riboflavin in the anterior chamber, and we look for that typically either with a slit lamp or there's different techniques for looking for flare, but you wanna make sure you have uniform distribution throughout the stroma of your riboflavin before you start the next phase, which is, um, again, the phase where you want to uh, first check for corneal thickness, and we want 400 microns of corneal thickness. And the reason we want that is to protect the endothelium from any damage potentially from the ultraviolet light, which is normally absorbed by the stroma, but the stroma is too thin, there is some potential. So we have to check corneal thickness before we irradiate the cornea with the ultraviolet light. If we get 400 millimeters of uh, microns of cornea, then we start the uh, ultraviolet light process for 30 minutes where we continue to apply the Fotrexa viscous every two minutes to keep the cornea uh, fully soaked in the riboflavin during that process. So from beginning to end, the whole process takes about, about an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. So um, it's not a fast process, but the patients are typically comfortable. Um, we'll give them some drops of anesthesia if they need it along the way, if they start to feel um, any discomfort, but it's usually well tolerated even by our youngest patients. In fact, the youngest patients tolerate it sometimes better than the adults. Um, but again, if we have a cornea that measures ultrasound below 400 microns, then we want to swell the cornea using the ordinary Fotrexa hypotonic solution. Um, here's a great study from the Southern College of Optometry that shows that the Fotrexa hypotonic solution can swell a cornea as much as 176 microns or 161 microns with an average of around 76 microns of swelling. So again, that's why we can take corneas that are even advanced to the point where they're 300 microns thick and still um, we can be reliable that we're gonna get at least 75 and oftentimes much more um, swelling with the Fotrexa solution, the hypotonic solution. So this is just a nice study done at SCO. Um, here's the actual procedure. I want to show you what the uh, what the KXL unit does. These are the focusing. This is one thing unique about the KXL unit. It has this focusing 
um, 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 stars. So you know that you're getting the right fluence treatment to the eye. Once we get the Fotrex of viscous in the eye, we measure their cornea. You see this cornea was only 338 microns. Then we wanna put the ordinary Fotrexa in to get the cornea to swell. We check it again, we got 406 microns. Now we can go ahead and irradiate the cornea with the ultraviolet light. And you'll see here the alignment. Again, this device is unique. Most other cross-linking devices that are used outside the US don't have these beautiful alignment and fluence assuring uh, uh, capabilities. So this is really one of the nicest devices out there. Um, just again, assuring that your patient gets exactly the treatment that you intend to. So let's talk about some of the, the, the uh, misnomers about cross-linking. Number one, when it first came out five years ago, it was not covered by insurance. So it was a burden for patients oftentimes to be able to afford this procedure. But today things have changed quite considerably. As you can see here in all 50 states, there's at least six major plans that cover cross-linking with 96% of commercial lives covered. So the majority of your patients will have coverage for cross-linking and it will be, it will be um, covered by insurance so it won't be out of pocket. Um, you see here FDA approved iLink. iLink is the marketing term for the FDA approved cross-linking procedure. So what about questions? These are things you have to talk to your patient about. Um, and it's very important that patients don't misunderstand what the purpose of cross-linking is. I've seen patients come back from cross-linking and they just didn't understand that the point of this was not to make them see better. The point of this was what is to stop the process of the disease so that they wouldn't continue to lose vision over time. So it's very important that they understand exactly what to expect afterwards. And also the fact that there is several months of healing to go on afterwards. So even whatever benefits they may perceive, they're not gonna perceive them in the first few days or weeks right after cross-linking. So they need to understand the process. They need to understand that it's not a refractive procedure in its current form cross-linking cannot predictably alter the refractive error. Um, so the patient will need ongoing care, likely contact lens care. Sometimes the contact lens care does get simplified. Other times they'll still need to wear a complex lens, maybe uh, continue with their scleral lens or their piggyback or their corneal RGP. Um, but occasionally they'll actually be able to simplify. I've had patients that can go to go from an RGP lens to a soft toric lens, or even sometimes they can now get a meaningful pair of glasses. Many of these patients may not have had a pair of glasses in the decade that was actually useful to them. And now maybe they, they can have restored best corrected vision. We'll talk more about that also. So what do, what do the patients ask me? Well, they ask me, well, why do I need this? And even more importantly, why does my, my, my son or daughter need this? Because sometimes we're talking about um, talking to the parents of patients that have uh, keratoconus at a very young age. So this was an outstanding economic analysis done by Dick Lindstrom, um, John Bertel, and Eric Donenfeld. And, and, and the key point to look at here is this middle part where you see 26% of the patients uh, reduction in the rate of needing a penetrating keratoplasty. And that's really our goal. A lot of patients think, well, don't worry, no big deal. I, this one day I'll get a new cornea and I'll be back to normal. And we all know that penetrating keratoplasties are not a solution to get back to normal. They're a last, uh, really a last alternative. And patient, patients that have penetrating keratoplasties need ongoing complex care. And oftentimes they may need a second keratoplasty depending on how young they are when they get their first one. So it is not a visual solution. It is a last resort. So we want to try to prevent them from that. And the interesting part about that 26% is we break that category into the slow progressors and the fast progressors. Take a look at the fast progressors. And these are oftentimes your young patients. If they had cross-linking eye link, only 2.5% went on to needing PKs but 92% of them had penetrating keratoplasties if they didn't get cross-linked. So it's particularly important that when we identify a progressor that's fast, that we get them to cross-linking as quickly as possible. Um, and when you look at the overall impacts to their, their, their quality of life and their impact on productivity and cost over a lifetime, you see that they, they, they calculated 28 less years in the advanced stages of the disease if we can identify them early, get them treated early. So really it's 
it, it really it puts the impetus on us to find these patients before they lose vision. And we talk about quality of life, and now we're starting to see some really good studies out there. there are, these are two of several that have come out in the last five years that studies quality of life. One of the things I talk to a lot of optometrists who fit a lot of keratoconus patients with contact lenses, and a lot of them really are under the impression that it all ends when you can achieve 2020 or 2025 vision, that the patient must be happy and they're back to quote unquote normal. But these studies clearly show that acuity is just one piece of the puzzle for quality of life. If you look in the left on the Candell et al. paper here, it shows that a lot of these patients, while they may get good vision with their contacts, they can't wear them all day, and they have to plan their whole life around their eight or 10 hours of wear, and that's really a, a reduction in quality of life. They also often can have pain and discomfort by the end of the day that reduces their quality of life. And there's, again, it's a, you can't go by just their best corrected vision and assume that they, they have a happy quality of life. On the paper on the right by Panthier, he talks about really focusing on the eye with the best corrected vision. So usually because of the asymmetry of the disease, one eye is much worse than the other. So it's most important that we have a good, uh, comfortable contact lens or even eyeglass, whatever you can do in that better eye. But it also really makes us rethink about the cross-linking adage where we used to always like, you know what, let's aggressively cross-link the worst eye first and then watch the other eye. I think a lot of doctors who are doing cross-linking now are much more aggressive in pre-treating the eye that hasn't lost vision um, because we see what happens to the fellow eye. And once the patient's second eye starts to become significantly involved, that's when their quality of life really goes down. So we really want to protect that better eye, um, again, because of the fact that that impacts their quality of life very significantly. The third thing is, again, rehabilitation. Again, cross-linking is not going to take away the astigmatism. It may make the astigmatism more regular, again, making it maybe slightly easier to fit a lens or maybe a simpler type of lens for a patient, but they're going to need ongoing vision care for the rest of their lives. Um, and so, it, again, this is important for optometrists to be involved in maximizing the care and the quality of life of these patients. So really important that we take this stuff into consideration when we're treating our keratoconus patients. One of the things that keratoconus patients ask all the time, especially if they're talking about maybe their 13-year-old child is, well, why can't we just wait? I really don't want my 13-year-old child to undergo a surgery. Um, and you know what? COVID-19 gave us the opportunity to look at some data that shows that waiting is really a bad thing, particularly in our younger population, particularly in our uh, fast progressing population. The first study here shot showed that um, because of COVID restrictions, most patients were delayed by at least three months. And in just in that period of time, they lost one more line of vision. Um, the goal study showed similar things again over, over a longer time period almost 40% of the patients lost significant vision. The Shadzit study showed that 88% of the patients in that study had a K-max uh, worsen in, the, in 12 months by one diopter. And finally, the Romano study, which is actually a more interesting study, showed really talked about surveillance and how closely we should watch these patients. And particularly their suggestions for patients under 18, that if we, if we diagnose progressive keratoconus, they shouldn't wait more than six weeks to get treated. They need to be treated right away. And even our older patients, if they're proven to be progressive, again, don't wait more than 12 weeks because these patients will have worse outcomes and lose vision that may not be able to be restored. So really is important when patients say, well, why don't we just come back in six months or a year? And I've had these patients do this and disappear and come back a year or two later and they're significantly worse. And especially when it's a young patient, it really is disheartening. So really it behooves us to have to help them understand why waiting is not in their best interest and likely they're gonna have a worse outcome if they do wait. And here, the last question is, well, how long does it last? And, you know, up until a year or two ago, we couldn't even answer this question because we didn't have long, long-term data. Um, Dr. Stephen Greenstein, um, Dr. John Gellies at the uh, CLEI Center for Keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey, published some data just recently that showed 10-year epi off outcomes from cross-linking. And this is the first publication that I've seen for, with 10-year data. Um, and it really showed that cross-linking is really remarkable. Even 10 years after treatment, it showed stable topography in the majority of the cohort. Better with keratoconus than with post-LASIK ectasia, 
but really look at the stable best corrected vision. 100% of the keratoconus eyes uh, had stable best corrected vision. You can see progression here was defined as a K-max steepening of two diopters or worsening of visual acuity by two lines or progression significant on the ABCD progression display. So again, cross-linking works, it works well. Most patients won't need repeated treatments, but occasionally a patient may need to be treated if we see progression happen. Um, and, these, and these patients often can be treated successfully. So what are the considerations for if, if, you, if you're seeing patients after cross-linking? It's gonna be a lot like a PRK patient in the sense they're gonna come in with a bandaged contact lens on their eye, um, the post-operative regimen is similar with a topical antibiotic, a topical steroid, topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, lubricating drops, and usually some oral medication for pain. Um, when you look at this phase three study and you see the, uh, the adverse events reported in the phase three study, very similar to PRK, um, we had, you get a few patients with corneal uh, epithelial defects that are persistent, some punctate keratitis, corneal stria, eye pain, blurred vision, um, reduced acuity. Um, these things are, are usually transient within the first month they're gone and occasionally they will um, end up going for more than one month, but by six months they're all resolved. The one thing that I think is important that we learned is that opacification or haze is actually a normal part of the healing from cross-linking. In fact, in the first three months you expect to see that and that will slowly resolve month by month um, as the patients heal after cross-linking. The follow-up schedule typically is like PRK a day later and a week later. By the week, you can usually see that the epithelium is closed and you can remove the contact lens. Um, again, there is no global period. So if you are, quote unquote, managing a, a cross-linking patient, um, instead of a co-management fee, you're going to build medical insurance. And the number of visits you see the patient will vary from patient to patient depending on how they're healing. And if any con any side effects that you see may require extra visits. But again, all these visits are built to medical insurance. So again, one day, one week, and one month again, now their cornea is starting to normalize. You start to do tomography and topography. Again, you start to assess their vision. And Clark is gonna talk in a few moments, but if they're wearing contact lenses, it's time to, time to get them back into their contact lenses in that eye. Um, and again, you still wanna see them three months, six months, sometimes nine months and 12 months afterwards. So for the first year, you're gonna see them multiple times. And again, this is all um, billable to their medical insurance. Clark, Great. why don't you take, take it away on, on uh, the contact lens consideration as I know you're an expert in this area. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so again, question that I'm sure both Dr. Tulu and myself gets asked all the time is, uh, you know, exactly when do we think that patients after crosslink can safely be refitted because uh, there are times that whether because they were not tolerant to contact lenses before or, or that uh, had not started wearing contact lenses, but you had caught the progression first and then decided to stabilize the um, disease as, as we all should, and then now are considering, you know, fitting this uh, new contact lens neophyte patient. And so typically I wait for approximately about three to four weeks in given, you know, typical um, course of healing as uh, Bill had described in um, a couple of slides uh, ahead of uh, this one. And so the, and obviously it all, I think it all also will depend on patients, um, you know, lifestyle, their needs, and the type of content lenses that they were used to, or that the type of content lenses, I think specifically that uh, you especially, I mean, uh, important uh, as an indicator uh, is the type of lens that you want to fit them into, right? Because if it were a content lens of you, because there's some of us that are a little more, you know, concerned about the fragility of epithelium, even though they're way stronger than you and I think, again, given a typical course of healing, by that week three, week four, you know, you're able to place most contact lenses on the eye. Um, and a lot of them really just could not function without, you know, with all the higher order aberration pending when they were detected in terms of their keratoconus. And so it is really a non-function for them to also wait for a long time. And so if it's a scleral lens, if it's a, you know, custom soft lens for keratoconus patients or things like that, that are maybe more protective or at least less, um, you know, epithelial, um, less traumatic factor for the epithelium. I certainly have times where I actually even begin refitting a little earlier um, than the um, than the three to four weeks in some cases. 
But I think the other question that you'll see in the next slide is that the um, another question that I get asked even as equally as often as this is, well, exactly what type of contact lens do you think we should fit all keratoconus patients? And obviously, there's not a magical answer. I think you all, as you know, astute uh, clinicians that we all are uh, tonight, because otherwise you wouldn't be on this webinar, um, would be that uh, there's really not, it's a, not a one size fits all situation. And, and case in point here, I looked at uh, 300, um, actually, Dr. as well as credit to the um, to our cornea fellow at that time, Dr. Angela Shin, um, who really helped looking at these consecutive 329 eyes that saw care at, um, at our clinic. And uh, the you know, the majority of them were uh, cross-linked. Some of them didn't really require cross-linking because they weren't progressing, but regardless, doesn't matter what type of lens I started with, whether it's corneal GP piggyback lenses, scleral lenses, um, you know, soft keratoconus lenses, hybrid lenses, majority of the time, the number obviously fluctuate a little bit depending on the actual design, but majority of the time, we get about 75% or 76% of success rate defined by the fact that patient claims uh, in the subsequent follow-up and after finalizing their uh, contact lens parameter, they come back and say, yes, I'm full-time wear wearing the lenses you know, every day for a certain, exceeding a certain number of hours. But what we find, so it's not so, it may be somewhat improved. If you look at CLEC study where at baseline patients were uh, in the, mostly in corneal GPs were about 65% uh, successful in tolerating or partially tolerating contact lenses. So yes, some improvements there due to contact lens advancement in the uh, technologies that we all use now. But look at what happened if I just use a completely different category of lens. Let's say if it's a corneal GP and patient is talking about discomfort, and then you switch over to that's just pick another lens design out of the hat, say a scleral lens. And regardless of which second lens we pick, the as you know, it, the success rate goes up way high to close to 95% and so on and so forth with number three and number four. So really, I think it's really more, I guess it is true, the adage of, you know, um, diversity is the, um, you know, is the most important thing in life. And that may, you know, may apply to content lenses too. Um, so having more, choices uh, for you to fit different corneas of your cornea of your keratoconus patients prove at least in my mind to be very important but still how would you decide which lens to use and that's why i included this flow chart for you in the next slide uh, and it's a uh, by an article uh came from an article for uh, by a very good friend of ours uh dr uh, Longis Michel, and a lot of people uh, likely already know him, needs no introduction, but I really like this flow chart uh, because not only does it have Ectasia keratoconus uh, decision tree that you could consider using, but also with other pathologies. Uh, so I thought it was really nice to um, leave it here for your reference uh, in case in the future you want to come back and listen to this lecture again and, and look up the decision tree. And should you feel like, yeah, you know, that may be a little, I, I still feel like uh, customization, I, I'm spending a lot of time on it. And I, I what, what if I don't have the time? Well, there are a lot of scan based technology now um, that you'll see in the next slide that will give you capacity and such as in Pentacam as well, you have the CSP module where you could capture, it's basically a pro, uh, you know, gives you a corneal um, profile as well as your scleral profile and combining the two, um, especially with the scleral profilometry, you're able to export that data into uh, different lens for diff to create different lens designs. In fact, I just talked to my resident yesterday, um, comes in to work with me at Will's Eye um, once a week and um, was very excited to tell me that he just saw uh, his first dispense patient back after designing a scleral lens using CSP and it was telling me how you know impressed he was. And a true story, this just happened yesterday. I wasn't even telling, he doesn't, I don't even think he knows that I'm giving this webinar uh, tonight. So uh, so it was, uh, anyway, just to show you that we have a lot of help that if we uh, if we should need it, it is, there for, it is there for our taking and it is definitely an improvement to our patient's quality of life and quality of vision. 
So after corneal cross-linking, you may think, hey, you know, what else is there that we could do uh, instrumentation-wise, not only to, you know, help us with, di help us with diagnosis and uh, determination of pro progression, but also, as Bill pointed out, it, it can be very important to still continue to monitor your patient's cornea after corneal cross-linking, especially a year and uh, thereafter, because they tend to sort of stabilize month six um, towards uh, between six and 12. And then therefore there after every, after which a point a lot of uh, clinical centers like to keep monitoring their patients either every year, sometimes even every six months pending, you know, exactly what they're following. So here you could actually dictate and say there's a, I need to reestablish a new baseline. My patient has had cross-linking treatment. And so you could do that, select a day. It will sort of reshuffle for you, if you will, because now all the future exams is going to be coming back and compare based on this new baseline that you had just indicated or this new baseline date. And you'll see that there's new um, new flags or new gates, if you want um, to uh, call it that, um, that are color blue telling you that this is a com this is a statistical analysis of confidence intervals that's applicable for patients after corneal cross-linking. And you could see in the next slide that uh, it will have, oh, I apologize. I, can we go back one more? Yes, we can. Just to show that it gives you new, uh, different baseline date. It gives you a, a new baseline date in all categories and of the patient. And then so thereafter, and you'll see a dotted line showing you that that's visually helping you along each category where that baseline is. Um, and therefore, you could compare kind of going forward uh, using just that bar graph. And Clark, I think it's important to also mention that when you use this feature, that none of the maps will show up in with the first 11 months after crosslinking. The first map will show up will, will be 12 months because the eye is still healing. Um, this display will not produce a post crosslinking map um, until it's 12 months out. And do you, by that, just so there is no confusion, you mean like the bar graph, or do you mean map as in obviously not the format? I'll put no, I mean, yeah, like like the blue line you see here, that this study has to be 12 months after the date you put in for the cross-linking. Otherwise, all the other studies that were done within that 12-month period won't show up on this display because, again, it's impossible to judge progression after cross-linking early on. Mm. So in that case, just a useful tip to, um, from you, Dr. Tulo, would you recommend then wait for you to have enough capture that's a year out before you come back and reselect the did you know the cross-linking baseline or would you just select the cross-linking baseline just know that the the um the blue flags won't appear until a year later yeah i would i would put the cross-linking data in as soon as it's done i would continue to take scans of the patients three six and nine months after it knowing that it won't be populated into this display but I would continue to take those scans to watch how the cornea is healing, um, just to be sure there's nothing unusual going on. But again, don't be surprised when six months after cross-linking, you do a Penicam and it doesn't show in this particular display because you've chosen your new baseline as a date of cross-linking. Perfect, thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about the future because as great as cross-linking is, there's a lot of research being done and we know the mechanism of action with cross-linking is riboflavin being activated by ultraviolet light, but we don't talk a lot about the chemical catalyst or the oxygen that's absolutely necessary for this reaction to occur. So what Glaucos has done is they've undertaken a pivotal trial study of epithelium on cross-linking. It's now in its US phase three, and this was a, a study of 279 eyes with progressive keratoconus at 14 sites, and they randomized the patients into the active progressive category and the control category. The control category got a placebo solution, and the actual treated category got epion ophthalmic solution riboflavin with supplemental oxygen. So in order to get the maximum efficacy, they've learned over time that adding oxygen to the procedure actually enhances the efficacy of the cross-linking. And they also learned that pulsing the ultraviolet light, giving the eye a chance to recuperate from the oxygen usage by, again, pulsing that UV light made the efficacy even greater. So in this clinical trial, they incorporated both the supplemental oxygen 
and the Pulse UV to maximize the outcomes. And the primary endpoints was a difference of greater than one diopter between the treatment groups um, in mean K-max at, at six months uh, after treatment. And, and after six months, all the eyes in the control study were offered the treatment. Um, just again, we didn't want to watch people lose vision um, just because they were in a placebo group. But the, the uh, exciting, uh, the outcomes is that their primary endpoints appear to be achieved. Um, and again, this data is going to be submitted to the FDA uh, this year. So we're hoping, even though it's not currently approved, that we'll see some approval in the near future for epi on cross-linking, which will, again, just uh, even reduce further any safety concerns, make the comfort of the procedure even more tolerated. Um, so we're excited about this uh, FDA trial. And we're looking forward for the FDA to hopefully give us approval um, soon for this procedure. So more to follow as we get more information on this. Clark, you want to talk about a couple of other treatment modalities besides cross-linking that can help restore vision? Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, we know that uh, we are able to achieve a lot of these refractive uh, rehabilitation for our patients using contact lenses. And I do it every day in my, uh, you know, every day I go into my uh, um, contact lens clinic at Will's Eye. So it, it again, obviously that we already know and that's our strength and that's not, that's, um, you know, the reason that we are, you know, going light on that is because we know all of you have no way, you know, don't, you all of you already know this, and so that's the reason why we're focusing on some of the new surgical treatments. So Intax, a lot of us know that you know when you when we had corneal GP and the lower sag um, in from the satchel high from the lens, and sometimes it is a little harder to kind of vault over that mid peripheral elevation created by the Intax. However, I think now that we have scleral lenses and hybrid lenses, um, a, you know we may actually do better. And there are some surgical centers that are still uh, you know prefer especially outside of U.S., uh, very popular using, uh, you know, intrastromal ring segment because they have different design. Here you can see using a um, tree find to create the channel and then wrote, and inserting the um, plastic uh, material um, that the Intex uh, um, are made of. And some of you may, I've received questions about, you know, well, if you're inserting a synthetic material, and I've heard of some complications in the literature, is there another way that we could do something similar? Nothing against in the intrastromal segment. I, I like the idea, but I would prefer it to not be synthetic material. So here, there's a new procedure called CARS, or corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segment. I believe the first person who um, brought this to light is uh, Dr. Susan Jacob from India. So here, you could see that she tree finds the donor tissue, retaining only the stroma, and then um, using the corneal strip or the stromal strip, cut it into the size of the segment and then insert them into the uh, the similar channel that we would have created for impacts. And therefore, there's less elevation issues, if you would, and still same thing that you possibly could uh, obviously not a F approved and in, in FDA uh, approved in U.S., but possibly then can have a combination procedure with uh, cross-linking. And another similar procedure, while we don't, um, you know, I know only a couple surgeons in U.S. that is doing uh, the CARS um, procedure, but I also know one clinic side that where I did my corneal fellowship, uh, where Dr. Greenstein and, um, and Dr. Gallies and Dr. Peter Hirsch are, um, they have this new procedure called CTAC, where they have the cellularized corneal tissue um, that is obviously similar to the sort of allogenic um, donors that we are getting, and then they can insert it in different shape where they're full, whereas the, uh, you could see on the top, it's a bigger segment versus have a segment in the bottom, you could see the topography differences. And they're currently still trying to, you know, learn the algorithm and different ways of different location of insertion and different size to see if it matches different type of keratoconus and maximize the topography um, resurfacing of the procedure. And uh, the uh, yeah, obviously... another great tool that is being investigated and not yet FDA approved is topo guided PRK um, in, a diff in addition to cross linking. So, uh, initially done in, in Athens, Greece, with John Canalopoulos, where he would uh, first do the topo guided procedure and then cross link afterwards. 
Um, again, trying to regularize the cornea, improve uncorrected and best corrected vision, in addition to locking that cornea in place. A more recent study by uh, Eric Donenfeld uh, and, and uh, Dr. Nattis in Long Island actually did it the opposite way, where they actually would crosslink first, topo guide PRK second, achieving similar results. And uh, I think the key uh, parameter from this study is you look at the 12 month results where you see uncorrected vision, a mean improvement of four lines, and corrected distance vision, mean improvement of two lines. So again, just another way to not just stop the progression of the disease, but to help visually rehabilitate these eyes. And um, I've seen eyes get even more improvement than this, but again, just one more tool that some of our doctors out there are using to help our patients with keratoconus. And this is just an example of the patient before and after. And you see pre-PRK, they were uncorrected 2150. And now post-PRK, their uncorrected vision went to 2070. And their best correction also improved from 50 to 30. So again, just another way to make it easier for you to fit contacts, easier for them to possibly wear functional glasses. Again, all aimed at improving the quality of life of these patients. And Clark, you want to finish this up? Absolutely. Just a couple more slides, everybody hang in there with us. So obviously, why are we talking about these procedures and in the context in which we have presented? Obviously, the you know, the one of the utmost important goal for our keratoconus patients is that we could reduce the need for or defer maximally the need for corneal transplant. And there are publications out there that have already individually looked at the impact of just having corneal cross-linking years, few years before introduction of cross-linking in, in Norway, and then few years after so that you could compare uh, some of the initial effects of, uh, of this treatment being introduced into a country has uh, shown 53% um, re of reduction in uh, the utilization of corneal transplant, which is great news for us. And in the next slide, you'll see that some of the you know, risk factors pointing to the fact that, well, then in that case, if we have all these procedures that we could maximize the stabilization of the disease of keratoconus in, you know, a decade ago, we could even only dream of. And we have other, potentially, if the patient needs, whether contact lenses or the surgery and some of the surgery um, procedures that can improve vision that Bill and I had just uh, mentioned, why would anybody in this day and age still require corneal transplant? Well, if you look at that in the in the column, I'll point your attention to the uh, the roles under uh, ocular conditions. Really, the highest risk factor is a scar, in this case, related to corneal high drops. So it speaks to volumes to preventing patients from getting worse to a point where, whether it's, you know, contalens related or just naturally occurring scar uh, or high drops related scar, that if we could help them early on, we may be able to reduce their risk factor of needing a corneal transplant even more. And uh, and obviously if we, you know, we know that if we require, hopefully if it's, if it's a locate, depending on the location of the scar and how close it is to the, or how deep it is in the cornea, potentially, um, you know, doing a lamellar keratoplasty is better than a penetrating because you're at the very least preserve endothelium. So I have a very quick video here to show you how that can be done. Understand that sometimes patients progress to the point where they're so thin that you know, there is the risk of perforating decimates into the endothelium and therefore will still require conversion to a full thickness corneal transplant. So here we, and, and thank you for my cornea chief, Dr. Rapuano for supplying me with this video. So we tree fine to uh, use a tree fine to mark the cornea. And then as well as just, you know, being able to access the uh, stromal tissue underneath. Now this is a, this is a patient with, uh, as you can see, with a lot of scarring and actually not from, uh, not due to keratoconus, but regardless, just to show you how the procedure is done. And so we use the blade. Uh, before we do that, we'll introduce an air bubble into the anterior chamber. You'll see the purpose of that air bubble in the anterior chamber. Um, after the bubble is introduced, we do a big bubble method because a lot of people get those bubbles, um, the two different bubbles uh, confused. The big bubble method into the stroma is to separate the tissue to make it easier to tease off the tissue. But the bubble in the anterior chamber is to show us, give us a sort of sense of depth of where the anterior chamber is to guide us in 
um, operating through some sometimes these very thin cornea. Once we get down to about 90%, we will take a blade and, and perforate the very last step in very carefully into the decimate and careful, take caution not to um, go, not to perforate into, uh, into the anterior chambers through the uh, endothelium. So it's called the brave slash. And then after that, you see the air bubble is still intact, telling us that we did not breach the endothelium, right? That's another purpose for why that anterior chamber uh, bubble is introduced. And then we'll um, basically um, place the donor tissue without endothelium and then suture uh, as per surgeon's uh, preference. And uh, so that's uh, this is a great video and I want to thank Dr. Rapano again. So Bill, back to you. Sure. So we are over time, but I do have a lot of questions. Um, we'll try to answer a few of them and the rest we can try to answer via email. So Clark, let me pose some of these to you. Um, is it ever recommended to do cross-linking on both eyes the same day? How would you answer that question? And I know there's an on-label answer and then there's another answer. Right. Um, and so obviously we're at a unique situation where in US we have only one FDA approved um, treatment technology. And so if you not, to be honest, if you look at the labeling, there's not an indication, there's no instruction from the FDA on the label of the procedure in saying that you absolutely should do only one eye versus both eyes. It's really more a conventional understanding, very similar to cataract surgery, and that even that is changing slightly, right? Um, in that most sur most surgical centers will want to wait for one eye to stabilize for a period of time, see how the patient react to a certain procedure um, before they treat the other eye, um, and therefore most of the time in U.S. when you are talking about FDA-approved corneal cross-linking, majority of the surgeons, if not all of the surgeons that I know, will only will only perform cross-linking on one eye versus uh, be first and wait for it to stabilize, not necessarily fully heal like a year or two later, but separate it with some time to make sure that um, you know the epithelium and the infectious risk is under control, the patient does well before proceeding to the other eye. Hence the argument of, do we treat the worse eye first or the better eye first? And Clark, I think you would agree too, it, 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 a lot of it has to do too with the fact that if they're wearing bilateral contact lenses and you have to discontinue their lens wear for 30 days, it, it, it can be a really difficult period of time if both eyes are 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 out of their contact lenses um, and they're forced to Absolutely. even many of them don't even have spectacles and they can't see well with spectacles. So I, I think doing most doctors are doing one eye at a time for the practicality of it, too. So um, I, I have heard of a few exceptions and maybe with epi on cross linking, we'll see a different trend at some point. But I think right now the majority of of, of Surgeons for lots of different reasons are doing one eye at a time, giving that time eye time to heal. All right, let's uh, go to, here's a question, an interesting question, Clark. Are you comfortable using genetic testing, um, using polygenic scoring for in any way for um, counseling or, or considering consideration of treatment of risk factors? So uh, in your clinic, Clark, do you use genetic testing or recommend it for any of your patients? Um, at our cornea service, we have we discuss with patient or have discussed with patients in some cases with regard to the availability of genetic testing. We have not incorporated into our flow as a regular protocol. And some of the reason being that we do, you know, again, like everyone else, all clinicians, that the the more data we get, the better we do understand that, and I understand that, and I hope for that. And I think there is a future in being able to incorporate um, a genetic testing, uh, you know, hopefully into our regular practice. But the um, the sort of, you know, the polygenic score right now, as it stands, I feel like there's some, a lot of good work has been done, and I feel like some more work will be done soon to increase the you know, the accuracy of the testing and the, you know, the applicability clinically to our U.S. population, which potentially could have slightly different genetic pool um, than, you know, than other places where the studies have originated. And I think that's the reason why I think maybe right, not right now, um, but potentially in the future, I see a lot of potential for that. Excellent answer. 
Um, here's an interesting clinical question. Who is at risk for sterile infiltrates following cross-linking? And a uh, comment was, is it mostly phototoxic or epithelial trauma related? Um, I'll, I'll let you give your opinion. I'll, I'll throw my experience in too. Sure. So the question is, what are the most likely causes? Of... Yeah, or, or is there a, a patient profile that's at greater risk for sterile infiltrates in the early post-operative course? Um, you know, I've seen late, recently have read a few um, publications that have, were talking about the fact that patients with, you know, severe atopic disease, for example, mm -hmm. are more likely to, you know, have underlying inflammation. Obviously, we all know that. And that would potentially set them up to be patients who are more likely to regress. And therefore, this recent article I actually I, uh, that I just read a few days ago recommended epi off cross-linking for that reason, saying, well, you know, because you reduce the risk of regression. I would likely say the same thing about patients who are more at high risk, if you would, to develop um, something like a stereo infiltrate um, in, if they have more underlying inflammatory disease, uh, maybe persistent defect, if they have healing issues, such as maybe they had uh, prior episodes of epithelial basement issues that they already report to you. Um, those are two sort of group of patients that I would see, you know, they're probably at higher level risk to develop that kind of epithelial complication. And we should obviously watch them more carefully and maybe give them, you know, more uh, therapeutics, um, post-operative post therapeutics, maybe like an AMT or something like that to help them, uh, to help them heal. In terms of um, possibly what are some of the causes? It's really interesting. There's not, I haven't seen really any meta-analysis done globally to say, um, you know, what the cause is because the, the, you know, use, use, using UV light to conduct cross-linking, UV itself has uh, antimicrobial property. So it, it's even not in U.S. again, outside of U.S. have been thought, have been used to ex to investigate potential ability to use something like cross-linking, similar technique, um, not exactly the, the same, but similar technique in as a treatment for microbial keratitis, and therefore to say that it would then lead to more risk likelihood of uh, a steroid infiltrate or even ulcer it is the reason why there there's some you know conflict there or country there's um there's some conflict there that you know i don't think we have sorted out why some people as few as they are why do they have that kind of complication afterwards yeah i, I think the two things i would add to that clark and in my experience while i've seen a lot of cross-linking patients i've seen thousands of prk patients and I think you can't ignore two other things. One is just chronic blepharitis that's ignored um, and gives gives that that sterile infiltrate higher risk, and also a, a tight fitting bandage contact lens. Um, I think those two issues also um, will predispose patients to these sterile infiltrates in the early postoperative course. So I think I think it's so multifactorial. Um, again, the the eczema laser has a different frequency of UV light, but similar. Um, uh, exposure um, to UV light, and um, I think there's a lot of factors, and some of them are in, um, are in procedure related, and some of them are uh, related to either the patient's uh, anatomy, physiology, and the contact lens that's on their eyes. So there's a lot of issues, and it's and it's not a big issue. The sterile infiltrates, as long as they're identified, um, these patients do well. They, there's there's a good prognosis for these patients. The key thing is, is again, follow-up care and close care. Um, here's, a, here's a great question to end this with, um, just so we don't keep people on too late. Do you recommend screening all patients for keratoconus? Now, I'll answer mine first, Clark, then I'll let you close it out. I, I would say it's ideal if we can get to a point where we are screening all patients, particularly young patients. And I'll tie this into another question we asked about the incidence of keratoconus. And, and Clark, we can talk about these two things probably in the same, same sentence. Um, ideally, it would be great to, to screen, especially all young patients um, for keratoconus, uh, whether it's with a tomographer or, or a topographer. Um, and um, again, all those suspicious signs, those, those, uh, those specific signs we talked about, key in on those and make sure you, but it's very difficult to do to add uh, five minutes to every single eye exam. 
in a, cl in a clinic that sees a lot of patients a day. But it would be ideal if we can get to that point where we have a very quick screening process um, that we can do for our patients. Um, and yes. going to the incidence of keratoconus, I know for the last 15 years, there's been um, um, the U.S. data has shown the prevalence of keratoconus to be one in 2000, and that's been on a lot of websites for a long, long time. And most of us, our experience in, in, in the U.S. and outside the U.S. is that it's it depends on your clinical setting. I mean, when I was in refractive surgery setting, because we would self-select for these patients, it was probably closer to one in 50. In my primary care optometry office, it was probably closer to one in 750. Um, so a lot depends on your practice modality and what the incidence is um, for you in your clinic. Uh, but Clark, do you want to comment on that? And maybe I can also mention the fact that we're about to publish a study at Argo on a pediatric population out of ICO, uh, Illinois College of Optometry, um, that was primarily Hispanic and African-American population, but nevertheless shown that the pediatric prevalence in over 2,000 eyes was similar um, or, or four times greater than the one in 2000 or closer to the one in 500 uh, that was now being reported in a lot of the newer studies with the technologies that we're using now. So, Fox, what, what's your feeling about as far as should we screen every patient and as far as prevalence goes? Yeah, I mean, obviously really looking forward to the uh, the data that um, is between a collaboration between, uh, as you say, ICO and, and International Keratoconus Academy, um, looking at pediatric uh, population uh, in Chicago, uh, in Chicago uh, with regard to keratoconus prevalence. So yeah, look at really looking forward to reading that. But my, you know, so I think in two things, right? Number one, it speaks to the power of the instrumentation that we've been talking about today and last time. And that is the as the as we get better at detecting these patients, we will find more patients if we just use the if we use the uh, you know updated and appropriate technology. And so once we have that technology barrier lowered for us, then the the other side of the question would come back to the first question, then does that mean we should start screening as many patients as we can? If it's not everybody, at least in the patient, are more likely to, uh, or more prone to develop this condition, given the fact that the prevalence rate may be a different number nowadays. And so I think those are two related questions and they're indeed great. And the I, I think if we could, you know, since we're usually delegating someone else to do screening procedure, uh, our trusted technician in our clinic to help us out, um, you know, there I think there is great potential yet to be explored that, that you know, we would be great if we could start screening, if not everybody, at least the, you know, younger population, maybe 30, 35 or under. Uh, I don't just mean like in your teens. Um, because if you look at that pop, look at that study that I showed you with the uh, risk factor for corneal transplant, you see that patients in uh, at the um, age in their 20s and in their 30s are actually more likely to go and see corneal transplant if they feel likely feel the frustration that they've accumulated from a very young age with their vision and with their condition and with their anxiety. And if you think about the fact that I think a, a friend of uh, um, you know, we have a, um, a common friend who has said something that I oh, that have really always that you know impacted me a lot, and that is if you think about how many pediatric glaucoma patients we detect on a yearly basis, um, which most of us would say it's very low, and it may be virtually none, and yet we try to perform tonometry, some form of tonometry, where NCT tonal pen you know, applanation on anybody who will sit down in the, you know, enough for, with enough time for us to perform that procedure, even though we cannot bill for it. And when it, so I think we need to take that principle and apply it to tomography, apply it to, to um, tomography, um, because we have such great devices now, such as with the, you know, Oculus Pentacam and the flow, if we could delegate it properly, can be so quick that I, I would really think that it would benefit us, our profession and our patients, if we could get to the point where we, you know, not use billing as a reason, but start screening everyone. Great point, Clark. Again, yeah, we can, we can screen our patients in, in under four minutes, 
So it doesn't add significant time to our workup, and I think it's a great thing to do. I, I may not repeat it every year, but I'll get a baseline, and on some patients, depending on this, on on their prescription and their and and their findings, I might repeat it more often. But I think getting the baseline is really crucial, and if you have the device, even if it's just a placebo topographer, utilize it at the best you can. I want to thank. Clark, you for coming on tonight. It was fantastic. I always learn something when I listen to you. And I want to thank everyone for spending their time with us tonight. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a great evening.